Hey you guys, it's Cece and welcome to a reading vlog. So I recognize that I might look a little disgusting right now. I have been sick for a few days. It's terrible because all I want to do is film and I can't film because I'm sick and coughing and it's terrible. But this is a video that was chosen for me by my patrons to do and I wanted to start us out. Every single month my patrons vote on a video that I'm going to make and for January, because it is like the new year, it is the 13th time my patrons have voted on a video, they technically kind of selected two videos for me to do. The first is my TBR video that I did at the beginning of the month, detailing what I was going to read. And the second video is this one, the reading vlog, where I read the books <laughs> based on the theme that my patrons chose for me. The theme that my patrons chose was an author clean sweep. So basically, I was choosing books where I own more than one book by that author that I haven't read yet. Um, so I have an entire shelf of books, top to bottom, full shelves, uh, that I haven't read. So this was actually kind of easy because I had a ton of authors to choose from. I'll try to give you like an idea. So Audrey Coldthirst, I have two books. Renee Watson, two books. Emily Lloyd-Jones, I have two books. Um, S.K. Ali, two books, N.K. Jemison, two books right here. I have multiple books by Maureen Johnson. I have three books by Frederick Bachman, uh, two books by Leanne Moriarty. <laughs> Spoilers, which one I picked? <laughs> multiple books by Victoria Lee, um, a bunch of books by Sean David Hutchinson, uh, Victoria Schwab was on there, Ivan Coyote was on there. I think I'm forgetting some people on this shelf, but we're moving on. Sanjay Manan, Tracy Chi, A.S. King, all on there. Here's the other <laughs> Johnson, Emily Lloyd-Jones, and Schwab. Paula Garner, I have multiple books. Uh, three books by Agatha Christie. Two books by Toni Morrison. Um, there's the other Ivan Coyote book up there, close to Spider-Man. I had multiple Sarah Pinborough books. And up top I have... Uh, two Claire Legrand, I have two Samantha Shannon books, I have multiple books by Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner. I think that's it. Oh, I have my 2020 books up here. So I went through those and I chose some books to read. So let me show you what I'm going to be reading in this vlog. Um, I am reading This Side of Home by Renee Watson, which is what I'm going to start first. Um, Renee Watson is one of the authors. I chose her. I want to read at least two books by her this year. So I thought it would be good to start the year off right, reading a Renee Watson book. We'll see how I feel about that. Um, I chose Sanjia Manon as my second author. So Of Curses and Kisses is her 2020 release. This is releasing in February. I chose Leanne Moriarty. Like I said, spoilers for earlier. Um, I'm reading Big Little Lies because I really want to watch the show. It's time to get off my ass. So I'm going to read Big Little Eyes. My story collection, that's not part of this. I chose a Sean David Hutchinson book, At the Edge of the Universe. I think this is the earliest book by him that I own that I haven't read. So I picked that one. And the same went for Sarah Pinborough for Behind Her Eyes. This is the earliest release of hers that I had. So I am reading these five books. And we are starting... Ugh with this side of home. So, join me. I'll be sharing my thoughts as I read. So here's a winner for you. I showered. Look at that. I'm winning. I'm truly killing. I'm killing it right now. Hi, Leia. Um, I opened up my window so that I could vlog, and while I was in the shower, apparently the whole fire department and the paramedics pulled up at our apartment complex. Didn't hear them. Don't know who they're here for. Little concerning. But, you know, that, that was just like a little too close to comfort. One of my greatest fears is that there's going to be an instance where like there's a fire and I'm in the shower and I have to run out of my apartment naked. And um, speaking as someone whose family home has burned down, uh, I feel I'm allowed to make that joke. <laughs> you know? But yeah, at least that didn't come true. Um, so I'm not filming today. I was really hoping I was going to be able to, but it's not going to happen because I still sound terrible and it still hurts to speak. Oh, paramedics are out. Um, I started reading This Side of Home last night and I got about 60 pages in, almost 60, 56 pages in total. I'm really liking this so far. So I have read a book by Renee Watson before. Oh, fire department's out too, packing up their stuff. Well, 
Let's hope everything's good. Everyone's leaving. Ooh, fabulous. Oh, never mind. Oh, God. They're getting out of stretcher. Dear God. Okay. <laughs> this is an interesting update. Um, so I've read a Renee Watson book before, Piecing Me Together. This is a book about um, privilege within different communities and about how privilege is more complicated <laughs> than some people like to believe. It's not just divided along, along economic lines, race lines, um, gender lines, any of that kind of stuff. There are all of these little interlying things when it comes to privilege and how it affects people differently. And it can't be about comparing privilege, it just has to be about understanding where everyone is coming from and how these different things impact how they live their lives. Um, it's also about black girl magic and creating, and um, it's really, really beautiful. I like sobbed through reading this book, really liked it. So this side of home so far is seeming like it's about gentrification. Like Piecing Me Together, it's set in Portland. I believe Renee Watson is a West Coast local. I'm pretty sure she's from Oregon because every book or short story I've ever read by her is set in Oregon. I guess I could like look it up, see if one of these in the back says anything about Renee Watson. She grew up in Portland, Oregon, where this novel takes place and currently lives in New York City. Yeah. I'm liking this so far. Renee Watson has a very lyrical style. It's not like standard YA contemporary. It's much more poetic. It's not as straightforward. Well, my neighbor seems okay, but they are going to the hospital, so that's a worry. Um, but yeah, it's not as straightforward. There's a lot more to it. And that was true in Piecing Me Together. It's true in the short story I read of hers in Black Enough. Where is that? Renee Watson's story in Black Enough was also one of my favorites. So I wanted to read Renee Watson's books because I thought she might be a new favorite author for me. Um, and I'm really, really loving this so far. I'm really interested in the concept of, not in the concept of gentrification, like I'm not pro-gentrification, but I'm interested in how this book is about a young girl growing up, going to into her senior year of high school, dealing with her best friend moving away falling for a white boy who's moved in and how that all is impacted with like also being in a neighborhood that's currently being strongly impacted by gen gentrification. So I'm liking this so far. Um, I'm giving myself room to breathe on the other books that I plan to read for this video. If I get through this week and there's one that I'm not feeling, I get to choose one of the other books. <laughs> that was a possibility. So I'll keep you updated throughout but I'm really into this so far. Um, and hopefully I'll read it all really quickly. And then I will have a whole bunch of Renee Watson books that I can celebrate as being faves. And with that, the fire department and the paramedics are leaving. This has been a fascinating update, I'm sure. Well, I still feel terrible, but I just finished reading This Side of Home by Renee Watson. Woo, one book down. This book only took me two hours to read. <laughs> So hands up for a quick reading time. Um, why contemporaries usually take me two to three hours to finish in full, which is why I wanted to start with this book. There's just like no introducing the world, or there is introducing the world, but it's not as complex as like a fantasy world or a sci-fi world. So it's easier to get into. The language is usually a little easier to get into. Um, and I just breeze through contemporaries. That's just how it goes. I really liked this. I made a note last night that this book very much is about gentrification, but it's also about community, about talking with other people in your community, finding similarities and differences, and trying to come to an understanding. Um, it is still very much about gentrification and how that is unacceptable, about communities becoming gradually more and more white as the people of color are forced out of those communities but it's also about a young girl coming of age and talking to her neighbors, seeing where they are in life, seeing why that why they are there in her neighborhood. Um, so I really liked that. But the other thing that this focused on a lot is about how diversity isn't about creating faux sameness. Um, it should be about celebrating difference. When you are creating a diverse environment, it doesn't mean making everyone the same. It doesn't mean erasing everything that's different about each student in order for them all to feel more equal. Diversity is about 
celebrating differences, about celebrating cultures and backgrounds and learning about one another. It's about difference. It's not about erasing difference. And that was a really, really fascinating theme to find throughout here as well. Uh, I always feel like there are so many layers to everything that I read by Renee Watson. And I really liked this. I think that of her books that I've read, this is my least favorite, but least favorite only in that it was a four star read. And the other things I've read by her have been five star reads. So that's not a negative in any way. This is like an incredible piece of fiction. I really, really love it. And much like piecing me together, oh my god, the cats are zooming. Um, much like piecing me together, I think that this is not talked about as much. And I hope that that changes. I hope that more people pick this up. It's like an under the radar YA contemporary. And I think that more people should give it a shot. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so that is my foray into more Renee Watson books. I'm not sure what I'm going to read next. I've been feeling like Sarah Pinbro, just because I think thrillers I tend to get through quickly, but I'm also really worried I'm not going to like the Sarah Pinbro book, so we'll have to see. I will give you an update when I decide what I'm going to read next, but for now, that these are my feelings on this side of home. So I have the options for this TBR turned around on my bookshelf because I'm not going to talk about them in my TBR, and I not gonna show them to people. My shoddy attempt at a secret TBR, since that's apparently what booktube is now, a secret TBR. <laughs> Who knows if this is something I'm good at? I'm really not good at not telling people what I'm reading. I like to be loud about what I'm reading, so secret TBRs always kind of like, I feel at a distance from them. I like watching them, but when I do them, I'm like, but what if I just tell everybody what I'm reading? Anyway, these are not secret, since this is my uh, short story collection for the month and my patron chosen book for the month. Those aren't turned around. These are the four. I have two YA options and I always lean towards YA because those are gonna go faster, but I think I want to go with one of my adult options so that I can get through it, like prove that I'm reading these. I feel like Big Little Lies is gonna take me longer than I'm expecting because like I want to read it, I want to give Leanne Moriarty a try, but I also pretty much decided last year that I'm kind of done with stories about, like, suburban women, especially white suburban women. And I'm pretty sure that's what Leanne Moriarty writes. Whoopsies. Um, so I don't know if I'm in the mood for this yet. So I do think I'm going to do what I said I was going to do earlier and try to read Behind Her Eyes by Sarah Pinborough. What is this about? Great question! Secretary stuck in a rut. Um, oh no, it's about cheating, okay? Oh god, it's about cheating, it's about a married couple, but there are secrets involved, so are these both about- are these both about- it's gonna be fine, it's gonna be fine. We're gonna give it a go, I'm gonna try to start reading Behind Her Eyes by Sarah Pinbro, see how far I can get, and I'll let you know what I think about the beginning. This was a February 2017 book of the month book, um, let's find out what the fuck this book is about. <laughs> Hi, it's evening now. Um, I thought of one other thing I wanted to share about this side of home. I think what kept it from being a five star for me is that I feel like there were some storylines that didn't get any kind of resolution. They ranged from not so serious to serious, and they were touched on, but they weren't wrapped up in any way. Um, and I feel like it ended and I just wanted more because I, I knew there were so many threads that had never been fully wrapped up. So I feel like that's where I landed on that one. That's why I gave it the rating I did. But I'm updating you because I have read about 50 pages of Behind Her Eyes. So I thought I would let you know what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that this book is fucking weird. Like, I've heard Sarah Pinbro writes books that are just a wild ride. And uh, based on the 50 pages of this I've read, that seems 100% right. So this is about a woman. She has kissed a married man, and then she finds out that that married man is her new boss. So there's the that. But then also there is the married man's wife, Adele, and she seems like her husband is very controlling of her, and there's clearly a lot more going on in Adele's life than we know about. 
We know about at least one instance where she was sent to a treatment home and we know her parents died in a fire. And we know that David controls absolutely everything she does. So I feel like this is setting itself up to be a book about like either a crazy married couple, which I could almost get behind, um, or just like the lone crazy woman. Um, I'm not sure which one it's gonna be at this point. I don't always love those stories. <laughs> the crazy married woman. And I really don't like cheating narratives. Um, I don't feel like I can name a, that many books at all that contain cheating that I've ever enjoyed. Um, I'm getting over it because this is a thriller and generally speaking, my rules about the kinds of stuff I like to read about change when it comes to thrillers. I don't know what it is. I think it's because like there are a lot of things in fiction that I see and I'm like I don't want to have fiction that approves of those things. But thrillers feel like all bets are off. Thrillers and horror, not all bets are off, like I still definitely have some very specific rules that will prevent me from reading a book, but I'm a lot more forgiving of certain things because they're usually just balls to the wall. You know, they're just batshit, and I feel like I can't always apply the same morals to a thriller or a horror book that I could to, like, a YA contemporary. Trying to reserve judgment, um, and I will check back in with you if I have, like, a significant thought when I'm getting into this book, or likely when I've just finished the book. Hi there, is this cute? I thought I was getting better like a couple of days ago. I felt like I was getting better, but I'm just like sick forever, I think. I think I'm doomed. I'm gonna be ill forever, which I love. But rather than continuing to bitch about that, which I've spent a lot of my time doing, not necessarily in this vlog, but definitely to Brian, I'm going, I'm gonna soldier on. I'm gonna soldier on and I'm gonna talk about Behind Her Eyes by Sarah Pinborough. But I am not going to spend a lot of time talking about this book because it was so terrible. It was so bad that I'm gonna dedicate an entire spoilery video to it. So <laughs> look forward to that, I guess. Um, I don't usually do those kinds of videos, but this book is so perfect for a video like that, that I feel like an opportunity is staring me in the face, and if I don't do it, I will regret it for the remainder of my life. That's probably overly dramatic, but I'm feeling a little overly dramatic at this point, because I'm sick and I hate it, and I hate it so much. I just want to be a whiny little baby. <laughs> so, uh, some non-spoilery things, some thoughts. This was a fucking ride, I guess, a roller coaster, and I couldn't look away from it. It was sort of like a train wreck in that way. I just couldn't stop staring at what was happening. It took me a little bit to get into, like, it's been a few days since I last updated you because it was taking me a while to get through the beginning of this, but like, I read the last half of this in the space of a day because I was like, <laughs> there reached a point where I was like, is this book really going here? Is that what, is that what's happening? And after that point, I didn't stop reading it until I was done reading it, basically. Like, I hit that wall and I was like, there's no fucking way that this book is gonna make me do this, is gonna make me live through this. But it did, and here we are. I hated this. <laughs> I hated it so much. Um... I think it's funny because while I was reading this, my sister watched the movie A Simple Favor for the first time. A Simple Favor is one of the most ridiculous films I've ever watched in my entire life. I haven't read the book. I don't care to read the book. A Simple Favor is a great movie and it's so much fun. And so she was talking about that and I was like, oh my god, that movie is so batshit. You never know exactly where it's gonna go next. And then I was reading this and I felt the same way where I was like, I couldn't, like, on one hand, I should have been able to predict so many things about where this book was going, but also I couldn't have predicted a single thing about it. And then at that point, I think I was just comparing this to A Simple Favor, and it just wasn't going to stack up to that. That movie was a masterpiece. <laughs> this is an interesting rambly update. 
I hated this. I gave it one star. Look forward to a lengthy, spoilery review where I talk you through the entire plot of this book to make you understand what I went through, perhaps so that you don't have to go through the same thing. Um, and since this is an author clean sweep video, here's what I'm gonna do. I hated this book so much that I am going to get rid of Sarah Pinbrow's other book that I own. So, say goodbye behind her eyes and cross her heart. Not even gonna read it. Because you know what? Behind her eyes had like reviews that were all over the place. It was like five stars, two stars, one star, three stars. It was everywhere. Cross her heart has like unanimously two star reviews. <laughs> and if I hated this this much, no. Also, I'm not gonna uh, overtly spoil what happened at the end of this. I'm just gonna say like, <laughs> as a queer person, I wasn't a fan of this twist. So that's the other reason that Sarah Pinbro is getting a no from me canceling that not reading her second book you know what look at that i have cleared up some space on my bookshelves everything's going great for me my voice sounds like this i feel disgusting but everything's going great for me so i'm not reading big little eyes next gonna take some time um which means i am deciding between of curses and kisses and at the edge of the abyss i have read a book by Sean David Hutchinson before. I have never read a book by Santia Manon before. So, interesting. Interesting, interesting. Wait, is this a fantasy? Apparently this is a fa- I should have guessed. It's of curses and kisses. Like, this book wasn't going to be about legit curses. This is what my life is. I just keep finding out things are fantasy or are speculative <laughs> that I didn't think were, and then being like, you dumb shit. Why would it not be speculative? Um, I think, uh, I think I'm gonna go with Of Curses and Kisses next. I'm curious, it's a 2020 release, and I have been writing about all of the 2020 releases today. I've been putting them all down in my big 2020 calendar, so like, I'm hype about new books. I'm gonna jump into Of Curses and Kisses, and I will let you know what I think once I read a little bit more about this book, and I will give you more of a summary. From what I know about this book, it's kind of like a Beauty and the Beast thing, Of Curses and Kisses, because on the back it says, will the princess save the beast? So that sounds like Beauty and the Beast to me. I'll let you know more once I know more. So it's, it's definitely a Beauty and the Beast retelling, right? He fell into despair and lost all hope. For who could ever learn to love a beast? That's like, that's like the intro to the animated movie, right? Also, also, there's gonna be a map? This needs a map? What is this book? I don't know nothing about this book, apparently. Okay, so I finished about 58 pages of, of Curses and Kisses. Like, the closest to 50 pages I could get while also stopping at a chapter break. This is gonna be an interesting read. <laughs> this feels like the kind of book I would have loved in high school. Like, this would have been perfect for me in high school when all I wanted my entire life was just retellings. That's all I read. Like, my friends and I discovered Beastly and all of the other books by Alex Flynn and we read through all of those and then we discovered other retellings. It was just all that all the time. And I do still read retellings frequently, it's just that I tend to only read queer retellings at this point. Um, and this is not queer. I thought that there might be a queer side character, but from what I've gathered thus far, there isn't going to be a queer side character. I mean, I don't know about everybody yet, but I had theories. They were disproven. <laughs> um, I do like that it's a retelling. Like, I feel like they're easy to get, in get into. They're fun. I know the highs and lows, and I like reading books where I know the stakes, I know the score. It's just not something that I really read much at this point in my reading life, so it's been very strange getting into it because it feels odd. Um, so this is about Princess Jaya, um, who is a princess in the Indian monarchy, and her and her sister are going to this school, uh, this international school for, like, 
rich kids, kids who are children of monarchs and presidents and actors, and they're at this school because um, the enemy of J.S. family, the Emersons, they've had this feud going for like hundreds of years, and there's this curse on the Emersons that the Rouse J.S. family put on the Emersons. Um, but the Emersons put some kind of story about Jaya's little sister in the press that, like, really ruined her reputation. And so they are going to the school to, like, be out of the public eye for a while. But it was specifically chosen because, um, Jaya found out that Gray Emerson, the youngest Emerson, um, is going to that school. And she's decided the best way to get back at him because she thinks he's the one who like sold the story to the newspaper um her plan is to make gray emerson fall in love with her and then break his heart brutally but it appears that a curse is real like this is a fantasy book because gray thinks that the curse is real and something terrible is going to happen to him on his 18th birthday so curses are real and jaya has this like rose necklace that has a bunch of rubies on it and now one ruby has fallen off since she's met gray so i don't know it's gonna be interesting it's gonna be unlike what i normally read and i think that that's all i can say for now until i finish the book and i can tell you more about like my finalized thoughts it has been more days than i would like <laughs> um but I finished reading of Curses and Kisses by Santi Manan, so it's time to talk about it. Here's the thing. Um, I didn't hate this book. I didn't love this book. It is like an easy kind of three-star read. Here is the thing. I feel like if I wasn't reading this for a challenge, if I hadn't set this aside specifically to read for this video, I would have DNF'd it. Not because I was hating it, but because I knew right away exactly what star rating this was going to get. And for me, I feel like my brain has an easier time DNFing like three star books than one star books. Because one star books, I'm fueled by rage. And three star books, I'm just kind of like indifferent. And that makes it really hard to motivate myself to read that book. So let me explain why because I was having a really hard time putting into words my feelings on this book why I rated it what I did why I wasn't enjoying it um but I wasn't hating it so I read YA I read a lot of YA and I am an adult which is a pretty common thing on booktube a lot of adult readers read YA because young adult is like the biggest age group of readers out there right now like so much YA is being published and I think YA is also the most diverse age group of reading that's currently being published. Like booktube was founded on YA, so so many of us read YA, and I read YA. This is already rambling, but in the previous few years I have leaned away from YA more and more as I've gotten older, just because like I am an adult and I do find myself leaning towards adult fiction a lot of the time. So when I read YA, it's for specific reasons. I read a lot of queer YA, that is like 90% of the YA that I read is queer YA and there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the queer rep that's happening in YA is way better than it is in adult, oh my god. Um, but number two, I read those books to reclaim my own youth as someone who didn't come out until later in life. Like, being able to read books about queer teens helps me reclaim that part of my identity that I didn't get to claim when I was a teenager. And so I read them over and over and I reach for YA because it is a version of my own story. It's a version of my story that I didn't get to see. Um, and I also read YA that is going to be delving into important issues relating to teens today. Not because I want to be like hip with the teens, but because again, YA is doing a lot more than I think some other age groups are when it comes to talking about those issues. And I think that this book is incredibly valuable to young adult readers. I would have adored this book when I was in high school, um, but I'm not anymore. And so I just sort of found myself going back and forth because for me personally, there wasn't a reclaiming of my story. 
And that's okay, because not every book has to be about me. It's just that because of it, this book wasn't for me, and I just didn't quite get that level of investment that I sometimes get with other YA books. This is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast. I would say heavily a retelling of the animated Disney movie Beauty and the Beast um, instead of like the traditional fairy tale. Like they use a lot of cues from the movie specifically, which is fun because it means that there was a lot more that I recognized. And the reason I think I would have loved this in high school is because when I was reading retellings in high school, everyone in those retellings was white. That was what was being published in like 2010, was just white people in retellings. And so it would have been incredible if I had had this in high school because it would have been perfectly suited to my tastes. It is lavish, it's over the top, it's romantic, and it's a retelling of something I love a whole lot. There was um, eventually one character who was revealed to not be straight. Um, it wasn't like a reveal, it was a instance of the main character checking herself and realizing that she'd made an assumption about someone that was not the case. The other issue I had with this is that, um, like, not 50% of the book, but like 35% of this book was from Grey's point of view, and I didn't care about Grey at all. I was interested in Jaya because she was this interesting princess, this interesting older sister who was willing to sacrifice her entire happiness for her family's sake, for her younger sister's sake, and I liked her as a character, but Grey was just sort of this sad brooding white boy who had a lot of money and a dad who was mean to him, and I just genuinely didn't give a shit. <laughs> That's not my type of character. That's not the type of character that I'm interested in reading about. I hope that this review has made sense. I'm guessing this is going to be my longest review or discussion of this book because I was so divided and so frustrated with myself. Like, how am I going to talk about this in a way that truly emphasizes that if you like romance, if you like high school romance, especially royalty, like going to lavish dances, wearing fancy clothes, if that's the kind of romance that you're interested in, you're gonna love this. It's really, really fun for that. There was just a distance in it for me, and it, it wasn't for me. And it doesn't need to be for me. It doesn't need to be tailored for me because this is a YA book for YA readers. So if you're a high school reader, if you enjoy reading YA contemporaries, if you enjoy YA romances, Jaya is a girl who loves to read. She reads YA romances. She loves her family. She has a duty to her people, her country, her future. I think that you'll like this. For me, it was a three-star read. Um, and related to that, I kind of decided that When Dimple Met Rishi, which is the other book by Santia that I have, is not going to be for me either. I have heard a lot of really incredible things about this book, but this has been kind of a discovery process, knowing more what YA I want to read and knowing what YA isn't for me. Um, my sister actually recently read this copy of When Dibble Met Rishi and she really really liked it so I think I'm gonna probably send her of Curses and Kisses. I think she'll get a kick out of it. I'm gonna focus my time on some other books that I think I'm going to love more and that are going to be more well suited to me and my reading tastes. So yeah, if I think I'm gonna read a book and only give it three stars, that just isn't a huge motivation for me to read that book. I want to read books I'm going to love. I hope all of that made sense. I'll continue to think through it and work through it, but those are my feelings. What I'm going to read next. So I have two books, Big Little Lies and At the Edge of the Universe. I think I'm going to go with At the Edge of the Universe next, hoping that I can get through this YA a little quicker than that last YA book. This is YA speculative fiction. Um, it's about a boy and his best friend and I think boyfriends? Yeah, boy and his boyfriend. And then one day the boyfriend vanishes and no one thinks he's real, like he's gone from everyone's minds except for um, this main character who still remembers him. So it's kind of about like how do you mourn someone who no one else thinks ever existed? How do you search for someone who never existed? And I really feel like Sean David Hutchinson is... I've really loved a lot of his books, um, and this is the earliest of his that I haven't read yet. 
as I said at the beginning of this, so I'm gonna try to read this next. I have a tendency to get through Sean David Hutchinson books really quickly. I don't know why, by nature of me enjoying them maybe? Um, and I will let you know once I'm about 50 pages into this. And then we'll leave Big Little Lies for last. Hello. Uh, this is interesting, what my hair is doing right now. I guess that's what I get for sleeping on hair that I didn't, like, do. Like, I showered yesterday, and maybe it was still a little bit damp. I don't know. It's doing interesting things. Try to ignore it, but, you know, like, it's- I'm a mess. It's fine. Um, so I read 50... 54 pages yesterday of, um, At the Edge of the Universe. I took off my, uh, dust jacket, <laughs> as I always do. So, um, pretty much what I said about this book is accurate, that it's about a boy named Ozzy whose boyfriend, like, five months ago disappeared, and not just disappeared, but, like, no one seems to remember that he ever existed, and Ozzy's the only one who knows he existed. Um, but there's some other, there, there's some other stuff, too. Um, there's also the fact that at the beginning of this book, Ozzy is trying to go to Seattle. He's on a plane, and he gets taken off the plane by a police officer, and then the plane crashes, like, immediately, and it kills almost everyone. That's, like, the first chapter of the book, which is kind of a, an abrupt awakening. Um, but also, Ozzy seems to be the only person aware of the fact that the universe is shrinking. It's getting smaller and smaller. And so the chapter headings are the current size of the universe as it shrinks. So it's you got like a countdown clock where it starts here. So see, the, the number keeps going down. Um, and uh, Ozzy realized this because he thought he knew the size of the universe. And then one time he was looking it up and he was like, that doesn't seem right, but I'm probably misremembering. That doesn't sound right, but I don't know enough about stars to dispute it but he specifically looked at websites and was like, okay, that's the size of the universe. Let me just ch double check this. And then a week later, someone in science class is like, so we all know that the universe is this size and it had like halved in size. And he went back and checked all the same websites and they all set a new number. So Ozzy's the only one aware that the universe is shrinking. Things about Sean David Hutchinson's work. So this is the fourth book. I think this will be the fourth Sean David Hutchinson book I've read. I've read We Are the Ants, which I loved. It's one of my favorite books ever. I read The Apocalypse of Elena Mendoza, which I only thought was okay. But Leia, <laughs> goddamn, so upset when I'm not looking at her. Five Stages of Andrew Brawley, which I really liked as well. Not as much as We Are the Ants, but I still really liked it. So here are some things about Sean David Hutchinson. If you've never read him before, here's like an intro to his work. Um, Sean David Hutchinson writes about queerness, um, in pretty much everything he's ever written. He writes about mental health in a very serious, heads-on way that I know some people find very triggering, so please be aware of that going in, um, that his books tend to include themes of extreme depression and occasionally thoughts of suicide and stuff of that nature. That isn't the case so far with this book, but that is kind of a hallmark of his work. Um, and then he tends to write about very small interactions alongside the biggest possible stakes. So it's usually about just one character or one character in their relationship to another character that is written alongside, you know, a universe ending possibility. And those things are both written about um, as though they are like they have the same stakes, which is a very interesting thing to do, and I am a fan of it most of the time. I don't think this is as true of The Five Stages of Andrew Brawley. That book is very small in scope. It doesn't have like a universe or world ending threat to it, but every other book that I've read by Sean David Hutchinson does have that. So I don't know if that's like a newer thing, uh, because I think Five Stages of Andrew Brawley is the earliest book that I've read by Sean David Hutchinson. Feel like that was a 2015 book and this is a 2017. Is that accurate? This is a 2017. Let's see. 2015. God, that's my secret superpower. Um, even if I was unaware of the book the year it was published, I'm very good at guessing which year a book was published. 
fun fact about me. So yeah, I'm really liking this. I feel like this is gonna go into the stack of Sean David Hutchinson books that I really enjoy. Sean David Hutchinson is like my favorite author writing today that is a queer dude who writes about queer dudes, um, which I think is really important, <laughs> just personally. When it comes to gay guy stories, also reading stories by gay guys, by queer guys, because a lot of queer dude stories are by women, which isn't inherently an issue. Like there's a bunch of other stuff that goes into that. But if those are the only books that you're reading about queer dudes, then maybe look into reading some books about queer dudes by queer dudes. Spread the support. Um, but I'm gonna read this while I wait for the footage to load so I can edit. Hi, I finished reading At the Edge of the Universe. Um, it's been like a week. I had a really, really bad few days, like a bout of depression, um, and basically didn't get any reading done, and then I read this in two days. <laughs> That's what's happened. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this, I guess, my thoughts. I think I'm gonna give it a four star review. I think my main issue is with the last chapter. It's weird. I feel like I wouldn't have been satisfied in my reading of this book without it, but I think that it took away ultimately from like the themes and the thoughts of this book, which are about like first love, about defining yourself outside of your first relationship. This also has some triggers for self-harm, um, attempted suicide, sexual abuse, um, pedophilia, so like there's some really intense stuff here that's all to do with a side character. Um, the main character is mostly dealing with depression and questioning like his place in the universe, which is what most of Sean David Hutchinson's books are about. They're about questioning a place in the universe, questioning who you are. Oh my god, every time she does this. Questioning who you are, how you fit in with the rest of the world and the world ending. Um, I think it was all really good for that. It's a very healing book. It's very much about healing while also knowing that like the world is about to end. You know who thinks the world is about to end? Leia, whenever I turn on a camera and focus on something instead of her. I liked this. I just think that the last chapter made it a weaker book overall. And I would have liked if this had sort of stopped before that last chapter. But I really liked the main character, Ozzy. I really liked Lua, who was his best friend friend. Lua is, I'm gonna say, gender fluid, which was nice to see. So that's kind of where I'm at with this book. Okay, walk in front of the camera. And that means I only have one book left, which is Big Little Lies. Oh my god. I know basically nothing about Big Little Lies, honestly. Um, I think it's a domestic thriller. I think it's set in some kind of I have Leia's hair in my nose. I think it's set in some kind of suburb and is about some crime that happens, but I'm not sure. So I'm not gonna tell you any more about this until I'm at least 50 pages in and I can give you a more succinct summary. Um, I'm so hyped that we're at the end of this, but I'm really worried that I'm not gonna like this book. Who knows, we'll have to see. Uh, the problem is then if I didn't like this book, it would mean that I only liked books by authors I've already read before and no authors that I newly tried out this video, which would be a shame. I feel like because of the way this vlog is, I keep trying to come up with new creative places to sit while I film, so it's not just 10 minutes at a time of me sitting in the same place over and over again. So this is slightly different, you can kind of see a different angle. Feeling very Olivia from Stories and Coffee, uh, Liv is a lovely booktuber and bookstagrammer, and her videos are always in a different place in her house, like every time she films, and it's absolutely ridiculous. I can't even imagine doing that. <laughs> but I feel like I've been channeling her for this video, trying desperately to find new places and new angles to set my phone down so that I can film this vlog. Um, so I am 55, 54 pages into Big Little Eyes, and now I can tell you a little bit more about it and what I'm feeling so far. Um, first of all, I think this is the most popular book on my Goodreads TBR. Like, if you sort my Goodreads TBR by the number of ratings, I am pretty certain this is the number one book on that list. Like, this is one of the most hyped books 
on my Goodreads TBR. So the stakes feel very high. Like the trade-off there is this is popular because it's a very commercial book. Like a lot of people who are passionate about reading have read it. A lot of people who aren't passionate about reading have read it. It was just one of those books that appealed to a lot of people. And what I think is interesting is that Leanne Moriarty is very commonly marketed as like a mom author, like <laughs> the kind of author that moms read, that middle-aged women pick up, which I think is interesting. Like the side of me that has always wanted to work in publishing is very fascinated by that and how an author who primarily reaches that demographic reaches a lot more people. Um, and then the feminist in me is always like, why do we just associate books about moms being what moms want to read? Like, it's it's a very fraught thing for me as a reader. It's something that I go through a lot when I'm thinking about it. Um, so this is a book that is set in Australia. They haven't said that, but I'm pretty sure I'm aware that this is set in Australia. So I guess that was another thing that I knew about it that I didn't say at the beginning. Anyway, this is about a group of moms um, whose children are in kindergarten, whether this is their first child or their fourth child. So we're getting to know all of these different moms, but also we are let know in the very first chapter, we are let in on the fact that this is all building towards a murder investigation. So while we are getting to know the moms, um, at the end of every chapter or in the middle of a chapter, we get little excerpts from interviews with all of these people. And that's how you are kind of being let in on the bigger problem, what we are hurtling towards with these women. So like the first chapter was like, all of these different women and a couple of dads um, theorizing where this big thing started. And then we flash back like six months before that. And yeah, that that's where I'm at. I'm actually liking this. I was really feeling like I wouldn't because I don't like reading books about suburban rich white people. <laughs> and their suburban rich white people problems, usually because it's about a bunch of racist moms who don't ever say anything ever. They just let everyone stomp all over them, and I just don't care. I don't care. I read a book, I think it was by Megan Abbott. I'll put the picture up on the screen, and that was like the last time I read a book where I was like, why am I reading this thriller? Why... I, I hate every part of reading this book about a woman who refuses to say anything ever. Um, and after I read that book, I was a lot more choosy about books that I was reading about suburban white women. And I still read a few. And then I started to read Where'd You Go Bernadette last year, and I just fucking hated it. I couldn't stand reading that book. It made me like physically angry to read that book and to read those words from this awful suburban white woman with their rich people problems. I just like, I don't fucking care. So I pretty much said I wasn't going to do that anymore. And then I started reading thrillers. And I've read thrillers here and there for the past few years of my life. Um, I tried to read them a lot when I was in college because my ex was reading a lot of thrillers. Um, people I was watching on booktube were reading a lot of thrillers, but I never really got into them. So that is what a lot of domestic thrillers are about. <laughs> this feels long-winded. Because I've been reading more thrillers in the past, like, year's worth of time, it means that I've been reaching more for these characters that I have pretty much been like, no. I'm done with you. But like I said, I'm actually enjoying it. I think it's because it's got a lot of lightness and humor that I'm appreciating. Um, Madeline, is it Madeline or Madeline? I can never fucking tell. I don't know, I like her, I'm drawn to her, I'm interested in her as a character, and so it's making me like this. And I'm interested in Jane as a character and Celeste as a character. And I'm wondering what's gonna happen when I start reading about the like true rich bitches of this book, like um, Renata who uh, met Jane and immediately just started saying racist things. So uh, I, I'm hoping that we're not going to get like Renata chapters, but I'm guessing we will be. And I'm going to have to just deal with that. It's going to be a ride. I'm actually pretty invested. It's going to take me a while to read, but I'm interested and I'm hoping it doesn't all go down the toilet the way so many thrillers do, like 90% of thrillers. Oh my god. Oh my, so much has happened <laughs> since last I updated you. Yeah, it's a lot. A lot has happened, most of which I can't talk about um, at all. Not because I'm like not emotionally ready or anything like that. Um, something incredibly 
like unspeakably amazing happened and I can't talk about it for a long time but um it kind of threw off the end of my reading month which is fine I will take something amazing happening over um something terrible happening and throwing off my month yeah this is gonna be your only like teaser for it um I might mention something about it in my wrap up but that's it so since I last updated you that happened I also cut off all my hair it looks different from the last time you saw it. This is the first day that I've, like, styled it myself, um, and I'm in love with it. Also, fun fact, this is my natural hair color. So yeah, if you were ever wondering what my natural hair was, this is it. Look at that. Look at that. It's blonde. It's like a sandy blonde. It's very weird. I haven't had my natural hair in years. Honestly, I don't think I've had my natural hair since maybe before high school. I think that was the last time so that happened as well. Basically, the way that this thing threw off the end of my reading month is that I had to drop everything and read three books in like two days, which I did, but it means that I'm not finishing a couple of the books that were originally on my January TBR, and it means that it took me longer to finish Big Little Lies. But I did finish Big Little Lies. So, oh my god, I don't know how to talk about this book, but um, I spent most of this book thinking this isn't something that you like, this isn't something you're gonna like, this is not your kind of book. And then it completely took me by surprise and I fucking loved it, which is so wild to me. I think it's because I sort of lived for this drama that was in this community. There was this ridiculous over-the-top rich person drama, which usually I'm not for. Um, <laughs> honestly, I just barely got back from a showing of Parasite, and now I'm, like, thinking about re-reading this book, and anyway, um, Parasite was amazing, too. Holy shit. Big Little Lies. It is a drama-filled, interesting thing, but it was also handling some topics that were a lot bigger than that, and that I think balanced the story really well. Um, not that this is, like, a, oh, great, we balanced the levity of this book with this, but there is a very serious discussion of spousal abuse, of physical abuse, of emotional abuse as well, and I think that that really leveled this book out. There's also the looming death, the looming murder, um, possibly, that has happened, and so, like, that is a big part of reading this book as well, is you're reading about the drama, but it's impossible to look away from. You can't stop reading it because it never gives you any information. It just keeps pulling you farther and farther into this net of interspersed stories of all of these different characters that you're introduced to spectacularly well for a book like this. Um, like this entire community. I don't know. I don't know what it is. This, this feels like an outlier for me as a book, but I loved it. I loved it. I gave this four and a half stars. I don't know how this happened. So I will be keeping my other Leanne Moriarty book. What is my other Leanne Moriarty book? Let's remind ourselves. So Truly Madly Guilty. I'm keeping Truly Madly Guilty. I'll read this. If I like this, I'm gonna read the rest of Leanne Moriarty's work because somehow I loved reading this. Those are my, those are my thoughts on Big Little Lies. Hot damn. So here are all the books that I read this week. My author clean sweep. I would say we had three big wins. Three that I felt really solidly about, two, or one that I just thought was okay, um, and one that I hated, obviously. It wasn't a clean sweep as far as authors who I'd read before, because this was the first Leanne Moriarty book I've ever read, so I didn't solely like authors I've read before. I discovered an author, a new author, that I can investigate further. Ultimately, I think this has been a really helpful video for me. I feel like I read some unexpected books, some books that might have sat on my shelves for a little while longer had I not pushed myself, so thank you to my patrons for choosing this as my January video. This is definitely going up in February, but it's the January patron pick, so thank you so much to all of my patrons for choosing this topic. It was a ton of fun. Um, I might do another video like this in the future. If this is something you liked, let me know down in the comments below. As you saw in that intro, I have a lot more books where I own multiple books by one author. I can do another author clean sweep video, or if you have another themed TBR that you think would be fun for me, let me know down in the comments below as well, especially now that you've gotten a peek at pretty much everything that's on my physical TBR. You've seen it. I showed you back at the beginning of this video. So look it over. 
suggest some ideas. I would love to hear them. It is January 30th, so as of right now, I have um, two days to finish my patron chosen book for January, <laughs> which was Song of Achilles. So I have to go jump into that right now. Um, yeah. Other than that, thank you all so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this vlog. Um, this was the last vlog that I'm gonna do on my phone. I'm gonna be switching back to my camera full time. This was sort of an experiment for ease while I was home and while I was at Disney, but I will be transitioning back into my camera. So hopefully that will make some of you happy. Thanks, thanks again for watching and I will see you in another video very soon. Bye.